and uh, it was in fact said that largely because of the the, the tr attempt to integrate the flute into that music, which was then still very bluesy, um, that that meant we would never be successful because it wasn't the instrument of the blues, and guitar was firmly, you know, the ruling musical instrument in that kind of a, a band. So the flute was seen as being a bit of a distraction and at best just a mild curiosity, and I think that put a lot of people off. I began playing flute largely because of uh, having given up as a guitarist when Mick Abrahams joined the band, uh, and so having a guitar to sell and being unable to sell it for cash, but given my choice of something to its approximate value in the music shop uh, by way of part exchange, I chose a microphone and uh, picked out the the other thing in the shop which interested me, which was a flute. I'd never played it and didn't really have any reason to choose it. It was just one of those spur-of-the-moment decisions to, to have a go. And I had it, I suppose, for a, a probably two or three months and didn't really manage to get anything other than the occasional squeak out of it. And uh, only really began to play it when Jethro Tull, under that name, started performing, and I had a one or two songs or one or two tunes that were tucked away in the back of my head from having listened to various jazz and blues records over the years and one of the pieces was uh, a Roland Kirk uh, tune called Serenade to a Cuckoo which I partly remembered, I don't think I remembered it correctly but it was in my head and I learned to play that and we included that as part of our uh, you know, performance at the time and also another piece by Bach called uh, Bure, or known as Bure. I think it was actually had a much longer and more correct title, but I, I heard it as a transcription for guitar and remembered the tune and later attempted that on flute. That was on the second album, I think. But uh, the, the flute was one of those sort of instruments that took a while to, to bring into the band. I was also playing harmonica and singing I can't remember if I played acoustic guitar or not in those days, perhaps I didn't. But I was invited by our management to uh, give up playing the flute and give up singing and to stand at the back of the stage um, and perhaps learn a few chords on the electric piano and keep out of the way whilst Mick Abrahams sort of led the group from the front uh, an invitation which I declined on the grounds that I felt Mick's particular approach, however vital it was to the band in those days, was a very sort of predictable one in terms of the, the musical genre that was appealing, and I felt that it was m more fun and more interesting to introduce something perverse and uh, a little obscure as, as the flute was, and to push my own ability as a, a rather sort of, I suppose by then, the, the standards of then, a sort of eccentric kind of entertainer. And I think the double act between Mick and myself worked very well in those days. In as much as we were different to all the other blues bands, we had a, a kind of a light-hearted patter, a sort of a, a bit of low-key comedy about the band, which meant we didn't take ourselves too seriously, but ironically everybody else did. We weren't forcing into their ears the kind of purest blues that was the accepted norm and was that sort of rather refined or a distilled sort of guitar playing that Peter Green, for example, did so well. We were always a bit more kind of rough and ready and a bit, if you like, the punks of the of the blues scene, in a sense. So we, we, we struggled on like that, and I ignored our manager's advice and carried on becoming ever more the front man. And we got to a bit of a crossroads, really, at the end of 68, when Mick Abrahams decided to enforce his uh, sort of attitude about playing gigs and traveling by giving us a bit of an ultimatum that he was only prepared to play three or at most four nights a week within a radius of you know 200 miles of London or something and that he wasn't prepared to travel abroad or fly on airplanes or do any of that sort of stuff and you know for the rest of us we um, we felt that we should, you know, play eight nights a week if necessary and travel wherever we could, you know, 
earn a few pounds. So you've got the chance now. Is the, now is the time to use the, the opportunity. Well, the opportunity was looming in as much as we were about to embark on uh, a European tour, which I think came. Uh, we did in fact go to Scandinavia briefly with Mick. We had to go on the boat. Um, but uh, we had a the sort of imminent European tour, which finally I think was cancelled in favour of doing that first American tour. And uh, without, you know, wishing to be nasty to Mick, we found it necessary to return his ultimatum by saying, look, either you do what the rest of us want or leave the band. And uh, so we had to find ourselves a new guitarist, which we did. And uh, after auditioning a number of people, we uh, selected Martin Barr, not because he was... Uh, not because he felt actually right for the band at the time, but because he was the one that seemed most keen and most willing to persevere and develop. He was probably also the least set in his ways, whereas a lot of the other guitars we did audition had very definite kind of styles and looked like the kind of people who might not progress, because remember at that time it was really the beginning of what became the progressive rock scene of the, of the 70s, and out of which so many of the famous British bands of that period and today came through a period of, of real excitement, I suppose, about expanding on the basic rock and roll that had gone on for the 10, 20 years prior to that and trying to integrate a lot of ideas that came from different music forms and from the expanding musicianship of... Uh, of the individuals concerned. I think at that time Britain was spawning more than its fair share of musicianly musicians, whereas now it seems again to be the other way around, that really when, you, when you're looking for good musicians you go to America and the British seem to have fallen back into over-stylized parodies. I'm talking now about the kind of music that is con you know, popular in the contemporary sense today from Britain, I mean the, the so-called new wave is, um, does not throw up many people that you would discuss really in terms of being good or bad musicians. They are stylists, they're very um, overtly concerned with the, uh, the image and the, the type of music they play rather than actually trying to play it exceedingly well. Anyway, that's again leaping forward into the... When Mick Abrahams left, you really took over the role of the leader of the band. Yes, in, in the sense that I was the uh, the one who found it easiest to get on with the, the management and record company and agency entities. I mean, it was always easier for me to talk to them than it was for the others. Um, that was just purely a personality thing, I suppose. But for that reason, as much as anything else, I did become involved in more of the the administrative side of running the group. I was I always wanted to question management policy and discuss those management decisions with them before they were actually acted upon by the group. I mean, I, the principle of, of things seemed important to me, so I began to become a bit aware of the, if you like, the business side of running the group. Without doing it myself, at least I was trying to keep in touch with you know, the whys and wherefores of it all, instead of just blindly becoming a, you know, mindless pop singer in a successful band, which, you know, even then, one was aware happened to a lot of other people, that they, you know, they got their paycheck for 50 pounds at the end of the week, and that was it, that, they were quite happy. Um, it all seemed important to me to know a bit more about it than that. 1969 was a, a good year for you. It was, the, it was the time of the second album, Stand Up, which went to number one, and also... You've got a number, you've got a, a top five single living in the past. 